think we're live. Hi there, I am Drew Badger, the founder of EnglishAnyone.com and the English Fluency Guide. And today we're going to talk about how to study English words so you speak fluently, you have rapid recall, you feel confident in conversations. We're going to talk about all this. Uh, post something in the chat. Let me know if chat is working. Uh, so hopefully it'll work on my phone again rather than on, uh, on the computer. <clears throat> So as usual, I will have a kind of the lesson at the beginning and then I will stay and answer questions if people have them. Let's see if chat is working. And I think, yes, it is working. All right, fantastic. Okay. Well, hello everyone. If you do have questions, nice to see everybody there. And uh, do click the like button. It's going to be an awesome video, but if you like the video, do click the like button uh, just to tell you, YouTube to send more people my way so I can help more people improve. Uh, so the reason I wanted to make this video is because I had a uh, just a question from a learner, one of our learners named Shang, uh, and he was asking, uh, how exactly do we study? Because he, he enjoys what I talk about, about naturally varied review and the way we should be reviewing vocabulary. Uh, but I wanted to speak very specifically about this. And I know the word study doesn't sound uh, very fun. People don't really like that idea. Uh, but the point of this, this is more like an adventure uh, where you're actually learning more about vocabulary and you're developing fluency as you do it rather than what people typically do with studying, which is just repeating something again and again. So you don't really, like if you think about studying for a test, it's usually trying to memorize some information that you just use on the test. Uh, but the kind of studying I'm talking about is like where you study something you're interested in. You continue to learn more about it uh, and you're enjoying things as you learn and you're learning a lot more and actually building fluency. So nice to see everybody there. Uh, I don't know how long this video will be or at least the lesson part of it, uh, but I wanna get started. I'll come back and answer questions uh, in a moment if people have them. But let's get right into this. <coughs> so I know some people uh, are going to be new uh, to learning with me, to learning as uh, or learning English as a first language. So let me speak briefly before I talk about studying specifically about the three things that you must get in order to build fluency. So the first one of these is going to be real speech. So you have to be learning the actual vocabulary that natives learn. You do learn some of this in traditional English classes, but a lot of it you do not. So you need to get slang and idioms and all of those other things. Uh, and not only the specific vocabulary, but the kinds of speech that natives will use. So they will have faster speech and they will blend the sounds of their words together. So faster than the way I'm speaking, less clear than the way I'm speaking right now, but you really need real speech. So the same vocabulary way of speaking, again, that natives are using. Uh, the second thing you need is you need to get understandable messages. So you need to actually understand this information like a native. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, the second and third thing we're going to really go deep into in this video, uh, because really the goal is fluency. So you can learn this information. I can try to study like get a list of idioms or something like that and try to review it again and again, but that's not really going to build my fluency if I don't understand it like a native. So I need to get understandable messages. This means, again, learning things the same way natives do. So you're learning English as a first language rather than trying to translate it through your native language, okay? And this is possible to do at any level. You really just need to get content that's appropriate for your level. So if I'm trying to read a book, for example, uh, if I want to read something in Chinese or, or whatever, a different language, uh, I need to read something that I can understand most of, like 80 to 90% of that information, so that any new vocabulary, I can understand that from context, okay? So we have understandable. understandable messages. Understandable, again, in English. So you can understand everything in English rather than uh, you using translations or trying to get definitions of things. 
Uh, and then the third thing, as I mentioned earlier, is naturally varied review. And we're going to talk uh, actually a lot about naturally varied review in this video because it's it's something I talk about a lot, but maybe some people still don't understand it, so it means I'm not explaining it well enough. Uh, but I want to talk about two different ways of doing this. Uh, there are many, but the point of the way of learning like a native speaker is that natives are actually getting lots of varied input, so they're hearing things from different people in different times, uh, like it could be like the past, the present, the future. They're learning these natural, tense, uh, natural tenses uh, and different ways of learning the language uh, in the same way that you would learn your, your native language. So you're hearing your mom and your dad say things to you, uh, or you hear your, you know, your teacher or something like that. Uh, and all of these things combined give you lots of the input that you need in order to build fluency. So we're going to talk about two of these kinds of things specifically in this video. Uh, so Sheng, he was talking about or asking me uh, what we do with trying to learn. He was trying to understand how naturally varied review works uh, and he likes the idea. He understands how important it is to go deep into the vocabulary you're learning. Because if you just learn something, maybe hear it one time, you might remember it, you might hear it and understand it in a conversation, but you probably won't feel very confident about using that vocabulary. So I wanted to talk about two different ways of doing this, specifically naturally varied review, so you can actually study things by yourself. So when you're learning new vocabulary, you can review it the right way and actually build fluency and fast recall. Uh, before I mention this though, uh, it's really important to remember that as, a, as a, like a, a, a native English speaker, or you can think about this even in your native language as you speak, um, you're not really thinking about vocabulary, you're thinking about situations. And because you're learning that way, you're not getting just one example. You don't learn just one word for money or one word for snow or something like that. You actually get lots of different examples. So this is part of that naturally varied review. I'll explain a little bit more about this in detail, but it's really important to understand that when you learn vocabulary, if you only focus on vocabulary and you just get translations and definitions, it will be really difficult for you to recall things in conversations because if you forget that one word or translation or something, then you will get stuck. So we really want to give you the mind of a native speaker, the mind of a fluid speaker, and this means you're able to just think about the situation and lots of different ways of expressing yourself will come to mind. So if I'm thinking like, what's a good word for money? I could say like, uh, I don't know, cash or dollars or greenbacks or frog skins or, you know, there are lots of other words I could use for money. Like if I'm talking about paper currency, American dollars. All right, but the point is because I know all those, if I forget one word or I can't think of one, I can easily switch to another. And this is really important if you want to speak fluently. All right, <clears throat> so in Sheng's question, he was giving the uh, specific example of steak. So like learning the word steak. Actually, let me erase this, make this a little bit clearer. So in his example, he had the word steak, and then he had maybe like two or three different examples of it, plus there was uh, some translations. There were some tra translations in Chinese, which I don't like seeing, but I understand some people have to, you know, it's, it's hard for them to stop using translations because they've done it for a long time. Uh, but I want to show you these two different ways of studying vocabulary when you learn something new. So this was his example. He actually sent me a, a picture of uh, just like a, a page from a notebook that had this on it. So we have the word steak, and then we have a couple of different examples of when we might use this. Now, even before we get to the word steak, where if you imagine you're a child, like a native English speaking child learning the language, if you hear the word steak, you actually could have even more uses of the word because steak can mean different things. It can actually have different spellings. S-T-E-A-K. So this version of steak here, this is like the steak that you eat. 
But this stake over here, the pronunciation is exactly the same. This EA and this AE, both of those make the same long A sound. So stake and stake, it's exactly the same. Uh, but again, it depends on the context. So you might even misspell it in a conversation or I guess in your writing. Um, but it's important to understand when you're learning a new word to, to really go deep into things like that, to understand what you're learning and then think about getting different examples of it. So the two like primary or core ways of learning vocabulary, we're, do, we're going to use the example of steak over here and do that. Uh, I'm gonna show you these two things here. So let's say we begin with the word steak, uh, and he gave me this spelling here, so we're talking about different kinds of steaks. Uh, you could have like there's like the steak, like an oak steak or something where you're, it's almost looking like a little thing that you hit into the ground like that, like a tent steak. Uh, or you could have an oak steak. This is like where you like stab a vampire with it, like ah, like uh, like the oak steak. Maybe if you've seen that in movies. Uh, but then we also have things like steaks, where you have like a piece of something. Or if we're talking about like uh, like a high high steaks, high steaks, uh, like high. Here, yeah, let me write this a bit more clearly. High steaks poke. So stakes, meaning like, what are we risking for that? Like we have like in, in a movie, uh, maybe if I don't save my wife or, or my children and I don't defeat the bad guy, then my whole family dies or something like that. So there's a high stakes. So high stakes in poker would mean I'm playing for a lot of money. So not like low stakes, it's high stakes. So when we're learning something like this, uh, it's important, I'm just going to give these kind of two different ways of looking at this, but we can imagine we start with a word like steak and then we want to look at different meanings of this because we don't want to just write down like 10 different meanings of it. We really want to make sure uh, we focus on one and then get lots of examples of that thing. So if we're talking about steak, like the physical steak like this, this is pretty easy to understand. And it does have the same spelling, steak. Uh, so we can just look at physical examples and that's pretty easy to understand. Yes, so as Alex says, it depends on the context. But it's important here that uh, we want to think about it like a native because if we ask a native and we say, what does the word steak mean? A native is going to say it depends on the context. What do you mean? Where are you talking about? So are you talking about this kind of steak? Or are you talking about like high stakes? Or what are the stakes of something? So I could have like a steak in a company. Like I could own a position of that or own a part of that. Uh, like having a uh, like shares of a company. It works the same way. So there are different ways of doing this and what you want to do is for each kind of example of something, you want to get enough examples. So it could be different words, like again, the oak steak or a tent steak. This is pretty easy to understand. So oak, so oak meaning it's made from the wood of an oak tree. So oak is a strong wood and we want to use that to kill the vampire. Uh, so an oak steak or a tent steak, same idea. So a tent stake, just like we have our uh, tent over here, and then we have maybe some strings or something that go down and we use the little stake to go into the ground so that we hold the tent down and the tent doesn't blow away. So we can easily get the idea of this, and what we're looking for is what I call the aha moment, where we really understand it. it's like, ah, I got it now. So now I understand this usage of stake. All right? So I could have like, uh, this usage of steak over here, and now I have just this one, but I understand it quite well, okay, a steak. So yes, it's kind of like a, like a big nail, basically. Like you can, it's, it basically looks like this. So a tent steak looks like this. It's just a little thing with a pointy end because it holds into the ground and I can hammer it down like that and it stays into the ground. So to stake something down, to stake something down. Yes, and so you can also talk about like like the physical stakes, like how much money you're spending, uh, or you can talk about like, um, like what was that? Someone just had that question. Yes, like the things that can be gained or lost, as Aaron uh, says. So we can have uh, different meanings of this, and what you want to do is make sure you get enough examples that you really understand it, all right? 
for each one of these things. So some words might have just one example. Like if we have the word cat, you know, there's, there's not like a lot of meanings of that. Not really. It's really just like the, like the animal, and we have a pretty good idea of what that means, and we can also understand very quickly what the word means. So there's not a lot of like worry or uh, ambiguity. So ambiguity means we're uncertain about exactly or precisely what something means. So it's ambiguous, ambiguous. But a word like steak, you might hear that, and like someone says, like you just hear the one example, like I'm out camping with my friends uh, and they say, hey, could you give me one of the steaks over there? So hand me a steak. And I think like, okay, like I'm just listening. I'm not seeing it written down, but I'm guessing they mean that because for this context, uh, yes, like we're trying to get this specific thing. I understand what the person is talking about. But if I'm in like a business meeting and they're talking about uh, like the stakes of launching this new product are very high. So if we do badly, if the new product doesn't do well, then maybe the company goes bankrupt. So the stakes are very high. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. So the point is like we want to get as many examples for each meaning as we need to understand something. So I remember a teacher asked me uh, many years ago, or not even that long, I think it was like last year or something. So they were asking like, how long or how much review do you need? Like how much studying do you need to understand something? And it really depends on you as the learner. So if the learner, you, are getting a lot of good examples, like okay, an oak steak and then a tent stake. Maybe at least like two or three examples, especially if it's something simple, like a physical object that you can see and touch, it's easy to understand, like a cat. Uh, but if maybe something is a little, a little more difficult, it's like, whoa, like, like high stakes or low stakes, uh, or I'm talking about getting a stake in a company like that, so I, do, I have a very low stake in that company. Or I have a low, like, stake in this in this argument. I don't really care so much about it. It's not very important to me. So I'm getting these different examples and I might need to get maybe more for like something a bit more difficult or more for um, something else, maybe more or less. All right. So I don't want you to think about like we need a hundred examples for each word. The point is not to get a lot of examples. It's really to, just to get to the point of understanding. Okay, is oak steak like the end of a wooden arrow or something? No, an oak steak is like a physical thing. Like just Google oak steak and you will see like people, it, it just looks like this. Like you can have like, it's a steak made of oak, <laughs> made out of oak wood like that. So usually it's a, like a kind of bigger thing. Maybe you've seen this in a vampire movie or something where you're trying to stab the heart of a vampire. <clears throat> and so that's where we get an oak steak, but a tent steak, or we could have a metal, like made out of metal, M-E-T-A-L, so a metal steak like this. It just has kind of a little hook on the end of it, and it's just a, like a curved piece of metal, and that sticks into the ground, and this little hook here, it's the same thing we can use for this. So we could put a rope or a string around this, maybe plastic steak, or it could be made of wood, or it could be made of metal, it doesn't really matter. But the idea is that you can like stake something into something else. Yeah, so it's like the same thing as, as a peg for this example, for this example. Yeah, so if we're talking about steaks, like cooking steaks, like S-T-E-A-K, that's a different thing, all right? But that's why it's important to understand this where you notice we're just spending time talking about one word. Okay, so this example, this is, it's kind of like you, you start with one word and then we're looking at different meanings of it and then we might get different examples until we really understand something. So that's the, that's the, the whole point of getting the varied review. So the, the opposite of this is where we take a word like steak and we just repeat the word again and again or I try to get a translation or a definition of the word. But the point is really to understand it like a native. So now it's like, oh, look at that. Like here's an oak steak. Or maybe I'm out camping and I don't have any steaks with me. So I take a tree branch. So if I, I'll try to draw a nicer picture for you here. So here's like, let's say uh, like a piece of a tree 
that I that I like break off. So this was a piece of a tree, but now like look at this, I can use it as a stake. So I break the tree off here. It's got a little hook right here. I can tie my string around that and then this part goes into the ground. So I hammer it in and then that sticks into the ground so my tent doesn't blow away. Okay? So we can also use this as a verb to stake something. All right? So it's the same word to stake. So here we have stake like the physical thing or we could have uh, using it as a verb as well, like to stake something, to stake something. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to look briefly at comments, uh, but I wanted to get through this before I give, uh, go back and, and answer anything else. Yes. So we're, we're talking about movement, like I am staking something, all right? And so just like this, we have like high stakes. Oh no, I guess, I guess sneeze. I held it in. Oh my goodness. All right. Pardon me, that happens. That's one of the, the magic of live video. So I could say I have like a high stake in something uh, or like a low stake. I don't really mind. I don't care so much. But is everybody getting this? Bless you. Thank you very much. All right. I don't want to mess up the camera. You like sneeze all over you. That would be very impolite. All right. Is everybody getting this? Hopefully this makes sense. So the first way that we can study vocabulary is we actually go deep into that by looking at different examples of the vocabulary. Yeah, much pollen. Uh, I, I think I'm kind of allergic to dust, I guess. I don't know if this room is particularly dusty. Who knows? It's not, it's not a very, it's not super bad, but uh, I'm okay. All right. So again, just to make this very clear, we're looking at different examples of this and, and you as a learner, you want to go through and get as many examples as you need to understand something. When you're like, ah, now I get it, then you can move on to the next word or another example or something like that, okay? Uh, can we use Frederick to learn a particular word? Yes, Kyoshi. So, uh, so Frederick works in a similar way like this. So what you will get in Frederick, like, let's say we have a word, like a more, a more difficult word. What's a more difficult word? So there are over 2,000 words in Frederick. And the way we do, uh, like, learning vocabulary, you will have a word, but we will give you a few different images to understand what that means. So the whole point, it's again giving you naturally varied review, but we're just using visual examples. So it could be an animation or it could be a picture. So Frederick, uh, you can click on the link in the description below this video. This is uh, the app I created to help people learn English as a first language, all in English. And so this is teaching you vocabulary, pronunciation, all of that stuff. Uh, you could have like a stake in a wall, but like typically a smaller thing, that would be more like a nail. What is the longest English word? Well, there, there's like, there's the joke answer and then there's probably like some answer, but like when, so little kids, I'll answer this question quickly. The longest English word is smiles because there's a mile between the S's. <laughs> this is a kid's joke. So what's the longest English word? Smiles because there's a mile between the S's. Yes. Even Sam Walton thought that was funny. Yes. So this is like adults. This is like a dad joke or whatever is a micro steak. Can that be a splinter? Uh, that's an interesting way of thinking about it. Like typically a splinter. And this is an interesting thing about, about like going deep into vocabulary. This is why I like doing these live videos because people always have some interesting questions. A splinter Typically, it kind of usually looks like some, if we, if we magnify it, so if we blow it up and make it look bigger, uh, it's kind of like this, but a, a stake is more, usually it has some kind of hook on the end of it like that. Okay, so that way we can, because you want to stake something down and then usually like attach something else. But you could have a stake like, like, the, like the vampire stake, it just looks like this. It's just a thicker thing like like that so it doesn't really have a hook on it it's just like to hold something down but in the case of this kind of stake if we're holding something down usually you put the stake in at an angle 
like this. So it's not straight into the ground. It would be like this. And then your rope or something would be hooked around that side. Okay, so if we're staking something into the ground. So very quickly, uh, just answering uh, Kyoshi's question about Frederick. So we're going to give you like different, different pictures of, of cats. And a cat is a pretty easy thing to understand. So here's just the, like the face of a cat. And here's like the whole you know, body with the tail. And I'm not going to draw these very well, but the point is that we want to give you different examples of that. And so some of them will be pictures, some of them will be animations, but if you'd like to get Frederick, you can click on the link in the description below this video. Uh, and this is the app uh, that, I was, that I was talking about before. So yes, like, so splinters are going to be a little bit different from a steak. All right, I wouldn't say like, I got a micro steak in my hand. People might think like I meant like, like the eating steak in that way. So if it's just a piece of wood, you could have like a metal, you could have a metal splinter as well, but usually like it's just a wood, a piece of wood, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So it's rather than me showing you this here, if you click on the link, you can download the app for free. Uh, if you'd like to upgrade, then you can get the whole thing, but you can play around with, with Frederick and see how it works. Okay, all right. So we just talked about the example of going deeper into vocabulary. So I'm just going to show this visually like this. So we have one word like steak, and we're going to go into it, and we want to get as many examples of each of the meanings of these things as we have. So we gave some examples of that, like a physical steak, the verb steak, we could talk about high stakes, low stakes, where something is important, or we have a high share or amount of something. Actually, I don't know if that's the longest word or not. I think there are longer words than that. Yeah, so steak and eggs is like, there. there's like, it's like, there's, you, and this is like a way of learning the vocabulary, but if you have some eggs, here's my egg right here, and there's the actual steak. So that's like steak, steak and eggs. But if we have this one where it's like, here's the egg and here's the, like a oak steak on it, like that, like that. So this is steak. So steak and eggs over here, depending on the spelling. <laughs> steak and eggs. But isn't this fun? Isn't this entertaining? So this is a lot better than just taking a word like steak and trying to repeat the word again and again or try to get a translation or look at a flashcard again and again. The point is to go deep into the vocabulary and understand all of the meanings. Maybe some words have uh, one meaning, other words only have, you know, like 10 or whatever it could be. So even like, even short words, we could have something like in or on or at those can actually have lots of meanings. And so usually what natives are doing, they're not trying to study like all of the meanings at the same time. They really just want to understand the situation. When do we use that word, okay? So here's, this is one way of doing this. We're kind of going deeper into the vocabulary. The other way of doing this is we're going laterally where we're learning different ways of expressing that same situation. So I used steak for this example because that's what Shang had asked me about. Uh, but this one, let's say I just hear a phrase from someone like, uh, I don't have time. So someone says to me, I don't have time. Now I don't really need to like go deeper into that. I understand what it means. It's a phrase, someone is, is busy or whatever, they, they don't have much time. But rather than trying to just repeat this, I also want to focus on the situation and hear different examples of that same thing. So what are other ways of expressing that? So another way you could say like, I'm busy. Or let's see, so I don't have time or I don't have much time. I don't have much time, so I'm busy. I'm in a rush. I'm in a rush. I'm in a rush. I'm in a hurry. Sorry, no time. Or you could say, sorry, no time to chat or no time to do whatever. 
So it's this specific situation. Maybe I'm talking with someone right now, uh, but I have to go. I'm sorry, I have to go. I don't have time. I'm busy. I don't have much time. I'm in a rush. Uh, I'm in a hurry. Sorry, no time. Okay. So there are different ways of doing this and what we're doing, so it's, you notice it's, it's different vocabulary. So here we're talking about the same vocabulary and we're looking at different meanings of it. But over here, it's actually different vocabulary. There might be something similar, but the point is native English speakers are focusing on the situation and they're learning all these different ways of saying that. So when you are in a conversation, you can use any one of these. And you don't have to have to try uh, like to perfectly remember them all. There might be some things where you remember it like very easily and you use that. So most people will have like a what I call like their go to phrase. So a go to phrase. So a go to phrase or something like that. And yes. And so you will learn like how do we say this? casually, how do we say this professionally, uh, and you will learn these, like these kind of nuances come from understanding the situation. So we, we focus on, on understanding the situation rather than trying to focus on the vocabulary. So who says I don't have time, when do they say that, and how do we say it so we're not going to be impolite. Like if I'm talking with my friend, I could just say, hey, I gotta go, I gotta go. So sorry apologies, but I gotta go. I gotta go. So I, so I have to go, or I gotta go. It's just different ways of, of watching the same or getting the same uh, situation. So when, when you're learning from uh, the traditional way with English as a second language, usually what you do is you would learn something like this and you would get a translation of that. But instead of thinking about the vocabulary, I want you to really just think about the situation and what might other people say in that situation. So yeah, like take a rain check, that's a good one. See you later, alligator. So that's another thing you might say that to like a little, a little kid, like see you later, alligator. And the little kid says, after a while, crocodile, if you've heard that before. But these are all things that you learn, and it's, and it's really getting you to think more like a native speaker, and a native speaker is thinking of situations. They're not thinking about vocabulary, okay? They're thinking about situations. So in this situation, what can I say? And they're able to process this very quickly because they have all these different examples. And as a learner, you might hear like, you know, these same kinds of things like, I'm busy, I don't have much time, I'm in a rush. And you can just think of one because maybe you don't remember all of them. And that's fine, you don't have to know all of these. But as you learn them, you will be prepared when other people say them and you will be able to use them yourself. You will at least have one of these things that comes to mind. Okay, so see you later alligator after a while. After a while, crocodile. All right. So these are the two, when you're thinking about studying vocabulary yourself, uh, this is not really about like taking a translation. So we'll put translation or a definition. We're thinking about what is the word if we want to focus on the vocabulary. So maybe you heard something uh, from somebody else uh, from a movie or you read something. Uh, take your time and, and try to go deep into that word. I know it's, it's kind of a pain to do this yourself. That's why the, you know, the nice thing about having a teacher who can actually go through it and explain all these things and make sure you understand it. Uh, but it is possible to do by yourself. So if you're ever, you're, when, you're, when you're learning something, you can feel if you don't really understand it or not. If you hear something and you're like, yeah, I kind of understand what they mean, like that's a high stakes poker match. Like, hmm, high stakes, I don't know what that means. And then you can contrast that with low stakes and then you start learning more about what, what do stakes mean? Like you're, you're like putting, you're investing something into something else. So if my family is going to be killed, if I don't, if I don't save my town, that's a pretty high stakes. So like the stake, I'm like gambling or, or putting something into a position like that where it could be hurt, where I could lose it, I could take it. That's why we call that like the stakes of something. 
And so as you get more examples of those things within each one of these situations, so remember there, there's like steak and then we've got the different meanings of it. So you might get more examples for each one of these things. Okay, is this making sense? And the other way to do this is, again, where I'm looking at the situation itself. So someone said, I don't have time, but maybe someone else says, I have to go, I'm busy. I'm sorry, I can't speak right now, I have to get going. And you hear all these different examples. And we could also go even further with this where we hear different people saying the same thing or different people talking in that situation. So my mother says one thing, my dad says something else, so I have no time. Yep, I have no time. So you can say I don't, and, and this is another amazing thing about vocabulary where people, they really think about like a grammar structure uh, I'll leave these up here. Um, so if they, they're thinking like, I uh, don't have, so don't have time, time. So I don't have time. If they hear that, they're really thinking about the grammar structure. Okay, it's like the subject and then like do not and then have and like instead of thinking about that, it's like in this situation, what, is, what does the person mean? What are they talking about? Because there are different ways of saying this. And even this grammar, like you could, you could not use the contraction. So I could say, I do not have time. And that makes it a little bit more polite. So I do not have time. Uh, or you could even make it shorter. I have no time. I have no time. Or I haven't, I haven't time. So instead of thinking about the grammar, we're thinking about what does the person say, what is the context, what is the situation, and there are different ways of saying this. So you don't have to be putting lots of pressure on yourself to, to use only one way of saying this. Because natives, even this, like if you can't remember some grammar construction, just say something different. Yeah, I got no time. You could say that as well. It's very casual, very conversational. Uh, it would sound a little bit better if you say, I've, I've got no time. Or you can just say, sorry, no time. Sorry, no time. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Everybody getting this? Can we say, I haven't time? Yes, you can. So I haven't time or I haven't any time. This sounds like it's a little bit more educated sounding. You could say that. Sorry, another time. Yep, you could. Running out of time. Yep, everybody's getting it. Everybody's getting it, okay? Everybody understands. So when you're thinking about doing this by yourself, I'll go back and check chat now, make sure I'm answering questions. But I don't, I don't want to give you too much to think about, but the point is, when you think about the word study, I want you to think about just going deeper and getting more information, but doing it in an interesting way that's actually teaching you something. So you don't really learn anything new by just repeating information. If I tell you the word steak and I give you like a Japanese or Chinese or whatever translation of it, and then you just repeat that again and again, I'm not giving you an actual lesson. I'm just giving you information to repeat. But here, the whole point is to actually help you learn something and you will feel confident with at least some of this. So maybe one phrase like, I'm busy. Anybody can remember that. I'm busy. And just to make it like a little bit more polite, you can just say, I'm sorry, I'm busy. Okay, or sorry, but I'm busy. So Tom asked, what's the difference between steak and steak? You have to go back and watch the beginning of this video and you can learn that, all right? Or uh, kind of one last thing I'll leave you with this is if you're checking the different spelling of something, so we do this in Frederick where we're teaching you the difference between like steak, like the physical food steak, uh, or so we, we like the difference between like L-E-E-K and L-E-A-K. So you actually learn that in Frederick and you can see the difference between what these are. So I haven't enough time, okay? So I don't have or I have not, okay? Same idea. So I have not, I have not time to teach you now. You know, like we can, we can uh, give you a kind of more elevated, uh, educated way of sounding it. 
Uh, does your app have phonics? Yes. So it covers phonics, sight words, sentences. It covers everything. So you will not find, if you want to learn phonics and you want to learn the pronunciations of words the same way natives do, uh, then that's how you do it. Yes, so learning vocabulary in a horizontal way, focusing on, yes. So again, like it's, it's easier, especially for a non-native speaker. But the, the reason I, I give this example also is because you might be in, uh, it doesn't cover the IPA because you don't need to know the IPA to learn the sounds. The IPA is, is useful if you're trying to learn many different languages, but if you're just trying to learn how to pronounce English, you should just hear it the same way natives do, okay? So if you're like if you hear the word steak and you only hear you will usually hear one example of that like the first time you hear it. So if you're out camping you will hear okay someone says steak and now you learn the word steak and you understand this meaning of it. But then you will be surprised when you hear someone else they're talking about steaks in poker and you don't understand like wait a minute I thought I thought steak meant this. So the whole point is like, it's not really to take something and then like to try to force yourself to study all these different examples, but the more the idea is like that you're prepared for these things uh, and that you're open when you do hear new examples of things that it's, it's actually the same word, but a different meaning. Okay. So yes, uh, this example, this really comes from you paying attention to native speakers in context. And so you might be watching a movie and someone says, I don't have time. Or you might have uh, a conversation with someone and they say, oh, I'm busy. I'm sorry right now. Uh, or you might be, yeah, so camping could be about steak or it could be about steak, either steak. All right. But be, be open for this. And the point is you're, I'm, I'm really trying to get you to think about it like a native uh, rather than uh, think about it like, like a student. All right, that's, that's, that's really the point of this lesson. All right, so thinking about the situation, and then you have the vocabulary here, and each one of these really is a situation. Okay, so like the physical stake, the, the verb to stake something, high stakes, low stakes in poker, stake in a company, that kind of thing. So as you learn something, in a conversation, you might hear a really quick sentence, but maybe some word sticks out at you. It's like, ah, okay, like, that's interesting. I got, uh, like, I heard that new word. Maybe I will take that, and if I don't quite understand it, I will take it and, and, and focus on that later. All right? But as you, I, most of the people I help, um, they will, like, they, they've been learning the traditional way for so many years uh, that it's, it's difficult to get them to kind of switch their mind to thinking like this. But if you do this, at first it will be a little bit tricky, but after a while it will be, become very easy and very natural for you. So horizontal st uh, stake or vertical stake. Yeah, I, I mean, you could, I don't know, physically it doesn't matter. You could put the stake horizontally or put it in vertically, I guess. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Let me go back and answer questions, make, make sure uh, these do make sense. Looks like a lot of, a lot of comments over here. Uh, I'm gonna start from, actually, let me just go back to the top here. But people are, people are getting it, I see, looking very quickly over the comments here. Now, if I go through and I don't read your comment, it's, probably just because I'm skipping through things, just ask it again, uh, just to make sure I, uh, I get everybody here. Uh, okay. Oh my goodness, a lot of comments today. Nice work, everybody. All right, so yes, good, uh, good morning, hello. So apologies if I don't go back and, and I don't have much time. I'm busy. <laughs> I don't have much time to go back and read everybody's like welcome, but thank you. It's great to see everybody here. All right, uh, let's see. So having high shares in the market can be also having high stakes in the market. Yes, so Alex answering that question from before. Uh, and no stake is not a nail. Okay, all right. Yes, so again, like you can learn like even short words like steak or something that it's just lots of new words for you. And when people play Frederick, it will actually teach you lots of new words as well. Uh, so hi teacher, you are so excellent. Well, thank you very much. I can't read the Chinese, but thank you. 
So hand me a steak, let's see. The bright side of it is up to us. Yes, says Aaron, always with the positive attitude. Eunice, hello, Teacher Drew, nice to see you there. Marcel says, I've been learning a lot from your videos for a long time. Thank you so much for everything. Big hug from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Nice to see you, thank you very much. Uh, and I think I answered those other questions. Tendo, I couldn't see that comment. Maybe I missed that, just post that again. 007 Was this is the first time to join you. Okay, it's like learning ouch in context. Yes, so you want to be learning everything in context the same way natives do. So when I talk about how to think like a native, this is how you train yourself to think like a native. So you can, if you're trying to study something, you actually just want to get more information. And even going to Google, like Google will like just tell you all these different definitions, but rather than just get the definition, spend time with them until you really understand it. And when you feel confident, then you will start speaking it fluently. That's how you become fluent. Uh, 100 days language journey. Hi, I'm from Korea. Nice to see you there. Uh, can we use Frederick to learn a particular word? Yes. Uh, so I don't have a, we don't have like a search function in there, but if you know what the word is, you, you should be able to go like, if you know what the phonics are, you can do that. Um, but rather than, you, you should just get into the app and see how it works. Yo, he says, I've been watching your videos lately to learn your methods and improve my listening skills. Glad to hear it. Dran says, in the U.S., when you sneeze, they say, bless you in my country. You sneeze, they stay away from you. <laughs> how long usually the lives stay on? So here we would say, like, how long do they last? Uh, or how long do they continue? How long are we on for? It depends. So this video has been going for 46 minutes. Um, it just depends on how the chat is going, if people have questions or not. Um, glad to hear Tom over there enjoying Frederick. Yes, do share the app. And also, if you have not already, please leave us a review of the app. So it helps us grow over there. Ah, okay, so Tendo answered, what is the longest word? All right. Uh, okay, I answered that one too. How about Davis? There are miles ahead of it. Uh, <laughs> yes, if you if you if you know if you know what that is, uh, I looked at them on a really interesting pictures. Okay, all right. So, like another easy thing you can do, just like how we do in Frederick, if you do a Google image search for something, so type in the word steak, like S T E A K, uh, then you will get like a different. Actually, I should have put S T A K E, steak. <laughs> for this. So you can look for uh, the actual definitions by just looking at the picture so you understand it like a native. Okay. Do you teach me pronunciation of the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? You should just watch the song if you want to learn that pronunciation. <laughs> can we call a bee sting a steak? No, you, I mean, you, you, uh, maybe you could, I mean, I suppose, but now nah, people, we could just call that like a stinger. Lean meat. Tons of fun. Here we go. I heard about steak and kidney pie. Is that a famous food? Uh, in Britain, I think, steak and kidney pie is a thing, but uh, in America, I don't think it's so popular. All right, I'm running out of time. I make up an excuse. Yes, yeah, so if you want to go back, check back with me later. Very good, Paul. Lots of good examples. Rachel, trying to find Frederick App. Just click on the link in the description below this video, and it will take you right there. So you can read more about the app and get the links to both Apple and Google for it. Uh, Yoy says, shouldn't I watch the same episode and video on Netflix and YouTube to touch on different situations? Uh, so like a, a way of doing this, like, like I did in the, I made a video about how to make espresso. And in that video, it's, it's four different people making espresso. So there are different ways you can get naturally varied review. One of those is to focus on a particular situation and then get lots of examples of that. So we have a person making a cake or a person changing a tire on their car or a person planting flowers or something like that. So you will find uh, some similarities some of the same vocabulary will be used and other vocabulary will be a little bit different. But the point is that you're understanding it like a native. So you can get this not only from video, you can read a blog post talking about how to change a tire also. And it might even be helpful to read that first and then watch a YouTube video about how to change a tire. 
but this is what natives are doing as they learn. So you might see someone physically doing it. You're on a TV show or something uh, like watching that or you're reading it in a book or you're listening to it on the radio. So there are different TV shows or, or radio programs or something that talk about those things. So the point is to get, you want to get enough information until you understand something where you're like, ah, now I got it. So once you understand something, that really you don't really need much review after that. Like the and this is why you can become more fluent by yourself because you, the point is not to just repeat things over and over or to say them over and over to other people or to try to repeat them to yourself. It's to get enough information that you understand something. So if I like if I'm if I'm a little child and I see oh, there's a lot of stuff on the screen here. If I am a small child and I'm just learning my native language, like I might see, uh, like, would you just put this up here? That's my my cat image. Uh, but a a small child, if a, if a parent just says like, you know, they're like blah. And I'm just putting some lines up here because the child doesn't know what anything means. They're just learning that. The first time they hear that, the, the child doesn't really know for sure what the parent means. So the, the parent says, oh, blah, blah. Like if I'm teaching you an alien language, it's the same thing. It's only after they hear, uh, like see more pictures of cats or more actual cats that you, that you get it, okay? <laughs> Alex being polite as usual. All right? It kind of looks, yeah. So anyway, as a child, as you're learning this, you don't know if I'm talking about animal or the color of the thing, or do I mean elephant, you know, if I'm a bad drawer or whatever. Uh, and so it's, again, you need enough examples until like the third or fourth example. Now your brain is like, okay, I got it. I can understand what it means. All right? Uh, Tomoko says, uh, can I use the present perfect? Someone passed away three years ago. What's your, what's your, instead of thinking about the vocabulary uh, or thinking about the name of a grammar point, what are you trying to express? So think, think about the situation. What are you trying to express? And, and that's why I, I don't spend a lot of video time talking about like here is the present perfect or the past perfect or whatever. It's more like trying to help you understand it like a native because natives aren't thinking about present perfect or past perfect or whatever. They're just thinking about like what the situation is. Uh, okay, I think I got through those. All right. Uh, let's see here. Jubert says... You're so amazing teacher. Now here you would say you're such an amazing teacher. You're such an amazing teacher. Or you can just say you're so amazing. Or you could say you're so amazing at teaching. Like you're good at teaching, you're amazing at teaching, something like that. So there are again many ways to express the same thing. I've to get going is useful. Yeah, we yeah, like you could you could say that like I have to get going, but like it's a it's kind of a, a fast way if you're if you're saying that. Uh, yes, if I'm talking on the phone or you're busy or something like that, Mom, it says, sorry to interrupt, but how can I create a situation to connect the language patterns chunks to my brain to recall them when this situation happens again so that I don't need to translate in my mind? So like the examples that I gave, uh, Mohammed, those are the things that you're doing. If you're, let's say you're in a situation and you hear some vocabulary, think about what is the context or the situation for that thing. So if my mother tells me to wash my hands, she's talking about that specific situation, talking about washing hands, uh, and someone else might tell me to wash my hands, or they might tell me to wash something else. Like, hey, wash your car, or right now I'm washing the windows. And as you get those different examples, like when you first, it's the same thing like this cat example. If you hear, wash your hands. And if you're new to the language, you might just hear, wash your hands. It's like, I don't really know what these words mean. Just, okay, wash my hands. So I see somebody doing something. So if, imagine, like, you know these words, like, so if I give it to you in Japanese, it's like, te o arainasa. 
So if I give you that, like you don't know what part, like, but if I, I can, I, I can give you like a, like a good, like it will give you like a quick quiz. I know there's some Japanese people watching this already, so don't answer the question for them. But if I give a few different examples, then you actually understand like what the word means. So I'm going to write it down in English to make it a little bit easier for you. So let's just say uh, like te wo arau, te wo arau, te wo arau. Uh, let's see, kuruma. It's hard to write it in English. <laughs> Uh, let's see. I'll change. I'll change it a little bit. Uh, so te wo kurumo araimashita. Let's see. Uh, kino kao kao. Okay. So te wo arau kurumo araimashita. Kino kao aratta. Now, which one of these words do you think means wash? So you hear me, I'm talking about like te o arau, or if I have like kuruma, kuruma o arau, kuruma arau, or kao, kao aratta, aratta. So if you hear those and you're just learning the language, it's like, oh, look at that, like, we have these variations of the word. I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, so th this is part of the point of learning as a first language. What I'm trying to do is remind you of what it was like when you were first learning your native language. So when you were young, you would just hear like a sentence like that. And, and you don't really understand like what that means, but maybe you see somebody doing something. Te o arau, te o arau. So people don't understand. So like a child hears this, like and they see an adult washing their hands. And over time, it's because they get these different examples of the word that they understand like, oh, like this is the actual word that means washing. This is meaning hand. And this is like, okay, we're understanding this is the object of the sentence. <clears throat> yeah, karate. So you hear like, like, so here we have like these three examples are connected together. So I could have like tail, I don't know, I could do, I could do something else with my hand. It's, it's the same thing we were talking about earlier in this video about getting the naturally varied review. So each one of these things, each time you hear it, it's helping you understand the vocabulary. The context is a little bit different, but if all these other words are different and this one is the same, okay, then this is probably the situation we understand what we're talking about here. Well, a yogi, ne? Yogi Productions. Yes, there are like some people actually uh, who are not Japanese, know some Japanese on the chat or in the chat, all right? So when you're, when you're learning this way, uh, at first, it's like, wow, like all this information is coming to you at one time and it feels a little bit overwhelming. Uh, but children, like you'll notice lots of times parents will say things to kids and kids actually don't know, they don't actually understand what they're talking about. My magic is too weak. You mean my magic marker, the magic marker, or my like physical magic, my magic is too weak. <laughs> yes. So like a magic, we would like a, in English, we would call this a magic marker or just like a whiteboard marker. Unless you're talking about my magic. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a little, a little deep into this, but it's, the point is to remind you of how you learned your native language. So you didn't understand everything all at one time. You usually understand things in pieces as you get more examples. And I'm saying that you should be doing the same thing in English. And my job is really to make it easy for you to understand with different examples. So it's not like too complicated, but this is just an example of Japanese where you're listening to things. Te wo arau. Kuruma, kuruma wo arau. Araimashita, araimashita. Kino kao aratta. 
All right, so I'm not gonna go into detail about like what these mean exactly, but you, you get a sense for what these words mean. That's the whole point. So if it's like, okay, like if you, if you got to hear me like repeat these 10 times and I got to show you exactly what I'm doing, you would start learning Japanese. So I've done that, like the marker examples that I give, it's the same idea. All right. All right, let's get some more comments over here. But I think that answers that question from Muhammad about like getting like the different, the different language patterns, they come from focusing on the situation and paying attention to what native speakers do. So what does a native speaker say in this situation? If you are busy or you're hungry or you have to go or you are crying or you are sad or happy, what do you say? Okay. So how do we, how do we use like, uh, how do we use all these different examples? He doesn't have all day. Very good, Muhammad. That's true. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you can see there are lots of different ways uh, for people to express something like, I don't have time. So, hey, I don't have all day, but notice like I'm not going to say that to my boss. So if my, I'm waiting for my boss to do something, so I'm, I'm in the office and my boss is taking some time to, to do something, it would be very impolite for me to go to my boss and say, hey, I don't have all day. <laughs> he would probably get angry at me or she would, you know, say something to me be like, like, you work for me. What do you mean you don't have all day? You have all day if I say you have all day, you know? So you're not going to be impolite about that. But you learn all of these subtle nuances of, okay, we want to be uh, polite and say we don't have time, but we want to say it in a way that's appropriate for the situation. But you learn that as you pay attention to what native speakers do. That's the whole point. All right, and I think, uh, all right. So let me know if that, if that doesn't, it's compulsory to learn each other all the time guys think about the situation look at the situation yes so a point like again think about how you learn new things in your native language if you hear something new it's like oh look there's a new word i don't quite know what that means and maybe you hear it a couple of different times and now you understand it all right okay so it's more informal way to say that got it yeah and again like without you you your your brain will process all of this automatically without you thinking about it if you focus on what people are saying because you will recognize like oh look at that like to a child i might say this but i would not say that same thing to an adult all right so i might i might say to my kids like hey hurry up let's go we're on the clock we're burning daylight we don't have much time i might say that but to my my co-workers or whatever i would say hey i know we don't have much time we should we should get moving you know, I'm going to going to pronounce things a little bit more clearly, nicely, uh, and and communicate in a slightly different way. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so I think I got that. So Kiyoshi said, learning vocabulary in a horizontal way and focusing. Oh, I think I answered that one. It looks easier to me. Yes. So it is a little bit easier to do that, uh, and you will get examples um, like in Fluent for Life. We we cover things like that, and what you will see as you watch different conversations, it's like, oh, that's interesting. One person said this, and another person said this, like talking about the same situation or in the same situation. Like if I'm interrupting someone, I might say, oh, sorry, uh, sorry for interrupting, but, or if someone else says. Like if I can, let me just say this or something. So there are different ways. Again, there are lots of different ways of expressing yourself. All right. Uh, since this says, hola, hola, question. Could I be able to get fluent in English just listening to English 24 seven? I'm so lazy to do any homework. <laughs> uh, yes. So you could like, what I'm doing now is just a small example of what we do in Fluent for Life. Uh, but the point of Fluent for Life is to help you understand English like a native. And we do this by giving you lots of like this kind of input. So you hear lessons like this, you see different people saying the vocabulary, you hear it in different situations, and just by listening, and so you're obviously doing some listening, some watching, you might read something, uh, but it doesn't feel like work. I mean, it's the same way you would learn new things in your native language, but it's more about learning things that you're interested in, 
in a deeper way. And so you develop fluency automatically without you having to speak with anybody else, without needing a practice partner or anything. So you're not like sitting and doing homework, you're not studying. Did this lesson feel like studying? If, if not, that's what the lessons are like. So some of it is like me actually teaching you things about vocabulary or culture or something. And uh, part of it is also just hearing lots of other people. So getting lots of examples and then also hearing it in real conversations. So uh, yes, you can get fluent uh, like just by listening to a lot of it, but it's not, you don't want to just listen to random English. You need to study it systematically. That's what's going to get you fluent much faster. All right. Got it about the app, says Rachel. Uh, let's see, sorry, how can we create a situation to connect? Oh, I think I answered that one already. All right, let me know, Mohammed, if, it, if I did not. <clears throat> uh, Yogi says, hello, my teach, you'd say teacher. My question is, what is the most important part about grammar or vocabulary, which we're learning first? Well, grammar, grammar is vocabulary. You can't have grammar without vocabulary. You can't have vocabulary without grammar. <laughs> like there's all, there's always some there's always some connection uh, between these things. It's like you can't have vocabulary without pronunciation. You have pronunciation with vocabulary because you say a word. You can hear me pronouncing words as you learn. So all these things, rather than thinking about them like a student, a native doesn't think about vocabulary and grammar and pronunciation as different things. It's all connected as one thing. Uh, let's see. Any books would you suggest to encounter these kinds of words? Well, get get Frederick for sure. Um, but it just if you if you want to go deeper, like to learn new words, what you really want to do is go deeper into the particular subject. So if I learn about cats, just to give a very simple example, so you probably know the word cat already, but maybe you don't know the word like feline or we don't know other words that are related to cats or talking about cats or something like that. So there are lots of different things as you go deeper, and this is what I mean uh, talking in this video about studying. So if I want to study more about cats, I want to read more, like what do I learn about them? Like how do they hunt? How do they eat? How do they live? How do they, I don't know, make baby cats or whatever. So these are all things that I can learn more about uh, and get and get lots more examples, and that will actually help me uh, get deeper into the vocabulary and teach me lots of new words that I had not anticipated. So it's the same thing, like if you learn, uh, like if I just learn about camping as an English, as a second language lesson, like, so here's like, let's say I learned like the Chinese word, I don't know what the Chinese word for camping is, uh, but let's say I'm just gonna, uh, like we'll just say Chinese, <clears throat> and then have, uh, like the English word over here. So English, so there's like some word in Chinese, some word for camp, like the word camping in English. But if I go deeper into that, there are lots of different things about camping. What kind of camping do I do? Am I doing camping with a tent? Am I sleeping outside just in a sleeping bag? Uh, do I have a camper, like one of those, like a camping vehicle? Uh, there are lots of different things you can get as you go deeper into that. And this is why I tell people, look at that, like around with a survival video. <laughs> so that's a whole topic that you can go deeper into. And it's, it's fractal this is a great word for you all, fractal. So a fractal is like something you can zoom into it and it, it re remains like the same shape. So it's better to Google that, but if you Google this word fractal, you can see a picture of what a fractal is. But if you zoom into a fractal, it, it doesn't change. It's like the same kind of shape or pattern. So as you zoom in on vocabulary or subjects or whatever, you will learn more about these particular things. You zoom into this one, you learn even more. You zoom into that one, and that's how you get more interested uh, in how you like actually study. Fractorial? Maybe you mean factorial, uh, but you can Google those <clears throat> and see what see what they mean. Uh, all right. All right. So yeah. So like, if you're if you're trying to learn new vocabulary, that's how I would do it. Rather than you, you would be focusing on a topic and go deeper into that. That's why I know I know like a lot of words about gardening things in Japanese that like other Japanese people don't even know because they don't 
you know, like they don't, they don't get that deep into the topic. Uh, let's see, I think both are truly important to know at the same time, guys. Please don't forget to hit the like button. Yes, here's a bit of psychology for you. It's better to say remember to hit the like button rather than don't forget. We want people thinking about remembering to do something. Phrasal verb go through. I don't know if that's a question or not. Not to mention that some words are used in metaphorical expressions. That's true. <clears throat> it's 10.38 p.m. here in Brazil. Is there a difference between go through and go over? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> but remember, uh, this is a specific example in this situation. Remember, we want to focus on the situation itself. So if I've got like a, a tunnel or something, I can go through the tunnel like that to go through something, or I can go over it. So that's this one specific situation. So you understand go through or go over something. All right, but if I go over something in uh, like in a meeting, I'm talking about different topics. So I'm going over like almost like it's it's a similar idea of like physically moving over something, but like I'm putting my eyes over something like that. So I'm going over it. First, we will do this thing, then this thing, then this thing, then this thing like that. I'm going over that. All right, <clears throat> but I could also go down a list. I could go, I could also like go through the things we're doing in a meeting in the same way. So it's important to really focus on the situation uh, rather than just look at the, um, like just looking at the vocabulary by itself. All right, see you alligators. All right, anybody, f any books for me to improve my oral spoken language? Yes, I would just get more, uh, get more examples of native speakers speaking. That's how you do it. So if you like reading, uh, reading is going to teach you more, but you have to watch actual people speaking. That's why in uh, Fluent for Life, we have people speaking. <laughs> so we give you, if you see lots of examples, it's like when I first came to Japan, uh, if I just listened to my like listening CD lesson or whatever, it's much different than how people actually speak. So I need to get lots of examples of how other people speak, and then I will feel comfortable, okay, this is kind of generally what people say. Uh, Abraham says, hi from Rocco. The first time I catch you on live, I saw a lot of your videos. Many thanks for aware us on learning English as the first language. Yes, you can say like or making us aware or just teaching us about something. Uh, let's see. Marzia says, I'm Iranian. Nice to see you there. Uh, Jobert. Is that Jobert? Jobert from Haiti. Apple pies. Let's see. Uh, it's for the first time I've taken part in this show, and I'm uh, blissful to be here with you guys. Glad to hear. Duran, is there a difference between go through and go... Oh, okay, right. In the context of reading comments. Uh, so, no. No. Nah. Because, again, like, I'm going... I can, I can think about it logically. I can picture that. Like, I'm kind of going through, like, a list of them, or I'm kind of going over them like that. It's, it's basically the same idea. Uh, let's see. All right. Can I use present? Yes, Tomo. So I think I, I got to that question already. Deep learning starting with a situation or context to learn English as a first language. All right, Yoe says, thank you much for your answer. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, Tomoko, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> I'm just telling you, to, telling you to rephrase it differently. So what is the situation? Like, are we talking about like somebody died or something happened in the past and we're talking about it now? What is the situation? Because if you can think about the situation, it's easier to think of the vocabulary. Uh, let's see, Thangos, Thangos says, when I watch movies or series, I see the phrase, I should get going. Is there a difference between I should get going or I should go? No. And again, uh, when you watch natives, there are lots of different ways to express yourself. So you don't, and this is another reason why it's important to learn with lots of different examples. This is why we put so many different examples in Fluent for Life. Because usually when students learn one example, they think that's the only way to say something, or they get nervous about saying something else. But native speakers, they see all these different ways of expressing yourself. And so look, I should go, I should get going, I should be leaving now, I should be on my way, okay? So those are just four different examples of how you might express the same thing, so that you're not feeling nervous about like this one thing, and if you don't say it correctly or perfectly, then you, you're messing it up, and then you, uh, it just it ruins the whole conversation, all right? So don't worry about a particular way of saying something, because there are always other ways of saying things. All right. Uh, let's see.
see. And Yogi says, have we got, have we get, or have we got? Because I have many more questions. Yes, if you have more questions, let me know. Uh, how can I, how can I do to join, or what can I do, or how can I? Just click on the link if you'd like to learn more about Fluent for Life. You can click on the link in the description below this video. Same thing about uh, Frederick as well. And if you have specific questions about uh, Fluent for Life, if you are a member already, let me know. Uh, or if you are also thinking about joining the program and if you have questions about it, uh, I'd love to know any reason why people are not thinking about joining, but let me know. Uh, Clark Zhang says, hello. Nice to see you there. How to improve our listening? Uh, because sometimes I'm trying some exercise to know where is my level of listening. I watch many other English content on YouTube. Do you have any tips for us, sir? Again, it's, it's listening for something. It's usually contextual. So you might be good at listening to English teachers on YouTube, but you're not good at listening to native speakers. So you need to spend more time listening to native speakers. And again, that's why we put that in Fluent for Life. Uh, oh no, Tomoko, I have to go. Thanks so much for a good lesson, glad to hear. Chinese from Tokyo, listening to your lives. Glad to hear it, Neko. All right, let's see. How I can I answer that one? I'm from India, could you please wear colored t-shirts? <laughs> people are worried about my t-shirts. Almost every chat people have, I guess, yeah, I'm kind of wearing a gray shirt on a kind of white, white background over here. Can you speak uh, Japanese fluently? Oh, shabaririyo. Yes, I can speak Japanese fluently. Dran says, sometimes when I speak with a native, I look at them waiting for their reaction if they got what I said. Yep, that, I mean, that happens sometimes. Now let's see, we got Cam says, hi, from Thailand. Look at that. Boom, we got to the end of the chat, the end of the chat. So we got through them. Uh, and again, like I'm talking about getting through them, like, like, look at that, like there's so many I have to like work through them all and now I finished. Good work. All right, so it looks like we've been going for 70 some minutes, 76 minutes and counting. But if you have any final questions, do let me know. I'm gonna take a quick drink over here. But if this has been valuable for you, please click the like button. So click the like button. It's been a while. Yes, I was on uh, vacation for a little bit, just spending some time with my family. We went to uh, just a local uh, island uh, not far from where we live. And we're just there for a couple of days. And yeah, so I didn't, didn't do any live, but I did release a few um, like pieces of lives. So I, I, I will probably do more of that. Uh, so releasing like pieces of lives because maybe people don't have time to watch everything, but there are some good, good gold nuggets, some good gold nuggets uh, inside these. Yes, so it was a good vacation with my family. Thank you very much. Some, oh, okay, I got that one already. Sandra says, I love the way you teach, Drew. Thank God you have time for us. Good night. <laughs> You're too kind, Sandra. Yes, uh, I enjoy teaching. That's why I do these live videos. It's a lot of fun to come and teach. Uh, so I miss like having a live class, but I like having my freedom as well. <laughs> so I don't want to have like, a, I, I might, maybe I'll do something in the future with like a group of live people physically in front of me. Sometimes I, I will attend classes that maybe friends of mine have. You speak Japanese, a body body, have a good day. Oh. Tomoko san, ego ganbatte kurasai ne. Mo bunpo wa mo chotto kangai sugi de shou. Ne. Tanoshin de kurasai. Ne. We got to think about the situation. Don't worry about the vocabulary so much uh, and you will enjoy yourself. It is a tsuyu. Uh well we're mm, we don't tsuyu tsu is is so that's the rainy season if you're talking about that. Um and that's usually before the summertime. So we don't, this is, this is kind of like the second slightly rainy, uh, maybe get some typhoon kind of things uh, coming in, but like regular to you is, is earlier in the year before summer. Yogi says, thank you. I'm so happy when my question was answered. You're a very good teach. You'd think, I think a, a teacher, uh, I think. By the way, I'm from Indonesia. Thanks again. Haran says, uh, yes. Tomoko says, arigatou gozaimasu. Yes, it's my pleasure. So for me, like learning Japanese, uh, it took me a while because I was not doing this. Like I was still trying to learn 
uh, Japanese through English, and that's why I had to like think and translate and hesitate. But I don't do that now when I speak, and I learn new things in Japanese all the time when I speak. All right. Uh, I keep checking on my notifications literally every day from you if you're on YouTube Live. <laughs> yes, again, like I, I don't have a schedule for the lives. Uh, and the reason I don't is because I, I you know, I, there's, I, don't, I don't need to like do a live video every day. I mean, I've got, I've got so much content already. And even for the people who are influent for life, there's like way more than anybody could go through. They could go through like a video every day and take like two years like to try to go through everything because there's so much content. Um, but yeah, like, and this is a, a tricky thing about language learning where people are always trying to get more new information when it's much better to go back and watch like a previous video or uh, get more information about those same kinds of things. Let's see. Uh, let's see. And Pusishka, if I'm pronouncing that. I'm from Ukraine. Here in the USA, we are three years and I still don't speak fluent because I'm afraid to speak. My children go to school and they told me that when I'm speaking with a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yes. So I like, sorry for laughing. This is the same problem I had. This is the same problem a lot of people have. And it's just because you don't learn English as a first language. And that's what I'm trying to help people do with these videos. So if you learn English as a second language, then you will make lots of mistakes. You will have your kids trying to correct your English or whatever. <laughs> and even my kids now, like I have to work harder <clears throat> at my Japanese just to make sure my kids are not like, I don't know, you know, like they're like saying like, <laughs> like my Japanese is bad or I make a mistake or something. So I'm like my, my older daughter is learning. She's a, a second year in elementary school. And so I, I, I have to learn like the next level of kanji before she gets to that <laughs> so I can help her. And she's like, well, I know that kanji, but you don't know that kanji. So I don't want to be embarrassed by my kids. But the reason I'm, I'm able to do that is because I'm learning Japanese as a first language. So I'm not trying to learn it through translations. It's, it's really difficult to do by yourself. I know, like, it's like I've been doing it for a long time. And I wish I had a teacher who knew how to teach me the way I teach, but I can only just like kind of teach myself that way. But that's why I put so much effort into Fluent for Life to make sure I have a program that does that for English for you guys. Angelica, please, could you do something about uh, present, past, and future perfect? At least, please, how to do more easily. <laughs> With a little, <laughs> what is that thing? <laughs> it's like a little blue monster kind of thing. That's pretty funny. Yes, like, uh, if you give me a situation, I can help you understand it. But if you're just thinking like, if, if you're already thinking about past perfect and present perfect and future perfect or whatever, like it will be more difficult for you. So I know you want a grammar example, but I'm asking you for a situation. So think like, what do you want to say? And then I can help you understand it better. So I have covered lots of things and we go into perfect tenses. Like we cover all that in uh, fluent for life as well. But uh, if you're looking for uh, like specific examples, it's much better for you to think about like something that happened in the past and then like it's not happening in the future or something like that. And actually I, I covered, uh, I think we did like past perfect in, I don't know, a couple of recent videos. I, I don't remember which one though. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's like a comment that people get. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Q Nero Zach, wow, you were talking Japanese with the Japanese facial mimics as well, I guess. <laughs> yeah, my, my face, like, I don't, I don't do the, um, like, the typical, when people are speaking Japanese, especially foreigners who have been here a long time, the, the Japanese often don't move their upper lip when they're talking, so it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like the, the, the top lip doesn't move as much. I don't really like the way that sounds, though. I like to pronounce my words a little bit more clearly. Uh, but you will hear that from, from some Japanese people and, and like foreigners that want to sound a little bit more. And like the, they really try to keep the upper lip without, without moving. But I say, oh, so does ne. You know, I'm like, I, I move, move my mouth a little bit more. 
Uh, Aran says, Aaron, let me know if it, is your name like Aran or Aaron? Let me know what that is. Uh, we are used to making mistakes in English. Yes, so that's another good thing. So if you are in the habit of making mistakes uh, because of how people typically learn, then yes, you will make more mistakes like that. So the point is for me to help you not do that and teach you in a different way. Uh, my advice is move to this guy place, change your children, teacher. Uh -huh, just kidding. <laughs> now remember, uh, you don't get fluent because you're in an English speaking country. You get fluent if you learn English as a first language. And that's why it doesn't matter where you learn. And you can also get fluent by yourself. So many of the people I help, they find me uh, because they have been living in the United States for 10 years, 20 years, and they still can't speak fluently. So the issue is, is really about how they speak because of how they learn. It's not where they learn. Okay, so you can be in Ukraine and still get fluent. We actually have lots of, lots of members in Ukraine. Uh, let's see, Dran, I appreciate you making the short videos from the live stream pointing out the important things. Yeah. Can you explain the phrase could use in different context and meanings? I saw a video clip using the phrase, I could use coffee. Does it mean I'll have coffee or I'll order coffee? Ah, so in that, in that sense, like there, there are two different meanings of that. So I could use something like listen, listen to the difference in my pronunciation because the pronunciation is also important here. So if I say uh, I could use, so I could use some coffee to wake me up. I could use some coffee to wake me up. All right. Or so, so that's like in that that meaning I could use like I could use someone hitting me on the head with a baseball bat to wake me up too. So I could do many things. All right, so I could do something. I could, like I could do this. It's a potential, a possibility. I could do this. So I could, I could use a coffee to do this. But I could use, I could really use a coffee. I could use a coffee like that. I could use a coffee right now. Ooh, I could use a vacation. I could use a vacation. I could use a vacation. So it's a slightly different meaning where it's like I really want that thing. Okay, so I could use something is like the possibility or I could use, I could use, I could use. All right, I don't want to make a whole lesson about it. But again, when you're listening for, uh, when you're hearing something, really focus on what is the situation being used. So if you're talking about um, like, is it a possibility of something or they're just saying like, I really need something. Ooh, I could use a nap. I could use a nap. I could use a nap. I could use a nap right now. I could use a vacation. Even after my vacation, I could use another vacation. You know, vacations are hard work. <laughs> so if you're taking like two little kids on a vacation, it's like not a vacation. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and so my wife were talking like we need to take another vacation, <clears throat> another vacation after that. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Uh... Explain either or and neither nor. I think I did that in a video, actually. Uh, you can look for those, a recent video. Elder says, sup, Drew, glad to hear you. I am all ears, thanks a bunch, glad to hear. Tomorrow says, thank you, sir, good Lord. <laughs> Bless your family, tree. <laughs> Love you all, you guys are funny. Uh, Alejandro says, yo, a brew. So people call me brew. <laughs> What's up, bro? Very true. Diddy says, what do you think? You probably mean think about teaching English through games activity. Is that a good idea? Could you give us some examples of the best games that make students speak? Thank you. Um, well, number one, like Frederick, <laughs> the whole reason we made Frederick is so it would teach people. It, it is a game that teaches you to speak. But the reason it's a game, just to make it very clear what a game is, it's letting you manipulate something and kind of test yourself like a puzzle. And so that, that's the thing that makes the learning fun rather than a teacher telling you what something means. So that is the game. But also I really want to make it clear uh, that if, you, if you're trying to force students to speak, it's like, hey guys, let's play a game where we, where we speak to each other. Uh, that's a typical thing that teachers will do in a conversation class or even just a regular, like a school class. It's like, hey, like, 
give this marker to someone and say, uh, here's a marker. And they pass the marker, here's the marker to someone else. But it's a much better idea to give them lots of examples of other people speaking. So they will understand automatically, like, oh, give me a marker, give me this, give me that, give me that, give me that. If they see 20 people with examples, then they're going to feel very confident about asking someone else, like, can you give me a marker or something. So rather than like thinking about playing a game, just make the language understandable and easy. Then they will want to speak. You don't have to trick students or get them to play a game. It's kind of the same thing with math games. It's like, it's not really like, a, it's just taking, it's taking the same boring lesson and then, and then like, okay, here's a point for you or something like that. So that's not really turning it into a game. Um, but to see how we do it in Frederick, the whole point of the app is that you teach yourself how the language works. And that's why it's fun because you discover that rather than a teacher explaining things to you. Uh, let's see, good question though. Mom, it says, what do they think about your accent in Japanese? Uh, yeah, I mean, people, people think I speak just fine. So it's, it's difficult to get a good, honest reading of people in Japan because people are very polite. And I could actually, uh, I could speak badly and people will think I say like, Watashi wa, uh, do, doru desu. So I could speak badly and people would say, wow, your Japanese is really good. <laughs> Just because they're very polite. Or if I can like use chopsticks or whatever, then people be very polite. But it's interesting as you're, you, you, you understand Japanese people and the, and the Japanese culture, because as you get really good, at speaking the language, people don't like really compliment you about the language. They're just like having a conversation with you. So when they don't compliment you, it means you speak well. And when they do compliment you, it means you're probably not a good speaker. <laughs> so sometimes you will see that, ah, uh, umai kana, umai kana. umai ga suki kero ne. <laughs> so it's, it's just a funny thing about the culture. So in America, it's like the opposite. So you go, you know, talk with people in America and Americans will like, they'll laugh at your accent or your pronunciation. If you make a mistake, they'll be like, yeah, man, we, why do you say it that way? Like, don't say it like that. Some Americans are going to be polite, uh, but it's, it's a lot less polite than, than uh, Japan is for that. All right, let's see here. Uh, why all of this absence? I don't know what that's referring to. Watch Robert De Niro's Midnight Run for I Could Use a Cup of Coffee. Yeah, so that's the same thing. Like I could use, I could really use a cup of coffee. Or you could say I could really go for something. So I could really, I could really go for a cup of coffee. If the logic of the grammar doesn't make sense, you can think like I could really use a cup of coffee to relax. That's the kind of idea of it. So like, I could use this to relax. It just means like, I would really like that right now. That would really be a good thing. Yeah, and again, code switching, I've talked about that on the, on the channel before uh, and how we, we like speak different ways depending on who we're speaking with. And we even do this in our native language as well. So HT Kim says your pronunciation or your expression and pronunciation is so understanding. So you would say it's so understandable. It's so understandable. All right, or it's so like understandable for me, or it's very easy to understand. All right, welcome everyone, KSA all time. Let's see, Tui says, hi teacher, I'm from Vietnam. You are making me feel free with English, so amazing. Yes, and so what I try to prove with all of these videos is that you don't need to speak to become fluent. You just need to understand the language better. And as you get more examples, and not just hearing me, but lots of other people, like other native speakers, then you will feel much more confident and you will think, ah, I can actually speak fluently. I understand the language well and I can communicate. So it's the same thing for me. As I learn more Japanese, I feel more confident every day. Let's see, umayne, yes. Code switch, okay, we got that. Do you speak Japanese in Nagasaki accent? Uh, I can sometimes. <laughs> I was at the Nagasaki, or there's a few Starbucks in Nagasaki, but I was at the, uh, where was that one? It was like the Yumesaito 10 one. Uh, so that's just a mall like in downtown Nagasaki. Um, and they said, because they, they, they know I like the, um, it's, a, it's a pumpkin scone. 
So like a little, like a bread thing that I'll get sometimes, but it's only available in the summer or in the, in the fall. And so I was talking with one of the staff there uh, and she said, like, it's uh, the, like that scone is coming back very soon. <laughs> and I, what did I say? I said like, uh, what did I say? I don't, I don't remember, but it was like, I just like used some Nagasaki Ben because it was funny or whatever. Like I don't usually talk in Nagasaki Ben, but I will use it sometimes. Uh, what did I say? I was like, uh, now I don't, I don't even remember what I said, what, what, what like my exact words were. That's interesting. <laughs> I can't remember, but I, ba I basically said like, uh, I was like, what did I say? I was like, gambaramba some, something. Uh, I was, and I, 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 and I said, I was like, uh, gaman de kinkensa. <laughs> <clears throat> and so she thought that was funny. I, so I was using Nagasaki Ben. I said, Gaman, Gaman de Kinkensa. Uh, and, and like trying to really say, it's like, Gaman de Kinkensa. Like I was really like trying to be like thick uh, with, and that's kind of local Nagasaki. And there's even like even thicker, uh, like, like if, if you go out like in like real, like rural places out here, like my wife's grandmother. So I'll go talk with her and it's like, it's almost impossible <laughs> so i really have to listen carefully to pay attention with what she's saying and she's like i'm just like what what did you say and i really have to yeah i'm much better now than i used to be <laughs> but yeah so so like yeah like gaman gaman de king kensa or whatever like that's like yeah i can't i can't like like ah like i can't wait but that's like like uh like there's even uh, there's a bar in Nagasaki called Tatamba, <laughs> so it's like it's like you have to stand. There's like Tatamba and Suaramba, like where you like you have to sit down and you have to stand up for the bar. Uh, so there, it's it's kind of like a like a like a dad joke basically. <laughs> uh, but yes, but when I when I'm when I'm I don't typically use uh, Nagasaki Ben, but I will just throw it like like. So some, like people will ask me that sometimes and it's like a common joke I will use with people. <clears throat> so they will say like, do you understand Nagasaki Ben? I'm like, well, how many walk on against like, nah. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, yeah, I understand. But like, oh, walk on against like, how many, nah. Like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> it's hard to understand. See, Mona says, so if you try to speak in Japanese, people are very happy. Yeah, so of course, like, and, and most of the time, uh, people are nervous about me because they don't speak English. And so if I go into a taxi or I'm asking a question or something, like I, I try to like, uh, you know, uh, and like just to, just to let them relax. <laughs> Uh, and so it, it's it's funny to have them because they'll, they'll if I get in the car and sometimes I will pretend like I don't speak Japanese and I'll just start speaking English to people <laughs> and some of them in that case like they their English comes out a little bit but other people it is like ah like walk on now walk on that I don't I don't understand I don't understand what you're saying so it, it's fun I've actually thought about doing like making making some YouTube videos about Japan stuff that you don't normally see. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you like a very quick topic idea that I thought about doing just because I know, you know like some Japanese people follow my channel and people do ask me about that. Um, make sure I got time here. So uh, Nagasaki is a rare city in Japan because it has a streetcar, like a little trolley that goes around the city. So we have we don't have a subway. We have regular, uh, like a regular train that goes into Nagasaki City. But Nagasaki is right on the coast, so that's the last stop on the train line. So around the city itself, we've got uh, the streetcar, or you can take buses. And one of the things I noticed about uh, Japanese, like the drivers of these vehicles, is that like the the train driver, the train conductor, has the highest voice. And then the, uh, the, the tram driver, the, the streetcar driver has like the, the second highest. And then the bus drivers have the lowest voice. <laughs> and I wanted to do like an experiment about that just to, just to like find out um, like, what, like if, that, if that was true, if other people noticed that. Because I've asked people about it like because like the, like the truck or the, um, 
like a train driver has a has like a quite high voice. It's like it's almost like a young like a like a, a teenage kid for a lot of them. It's just like a higher a higher train voice. It's like hashimas like it's a really like kind of high <laughs> And the tram driver is like and the and the bus driver is like you know. <laughs> and so I was wondering what, like if there was a like a real pattern there and why that was. So I wanted to do like a YouTube video about that. There's also like one other thing I will mention about Japan. This is an interesting thing and you notice little things like this. It's it's exactly like learning the language where you get into the nuances of the of the culture. And this is a thing maybe, like, I think a lot of Japanese people don't notice this either. But if you go to the, uh, like, a train station and order some train tickets at the counter, they have, there's like an invisible button on the, on the little terminal there. <laughs> and I remember asking, asking a woman about, like, why it was, like, why she was touching that. So, like, the... Usually they have a like a touch screen. You will say like I want to go to Tokyo or whatever and they have a bunch of little squares on the screen like this. And so this is the the screen here. But they will touch the screen like this and then they will touch up here. They will touch off of the screen where like this is just like where the speaker is or something. Like there's not anything actually there. So they will be like this like touching quickly, boom. And I was like, why are you touching that? I said, is there a button there? And she was just like, no, like that's just what we do. <laughs> and so I just thought that was like an interesting, an interesting, you know, thing about the about the language. But but when I find things like that, that's another opportunity for me to have a conversation with someone. Because I, I like to do that. Especially in Japan, um, like people are very like they're, they can be very robotic about their work. Like they just focus on something, like they're doing their work at like the convenience store or whatever, and they don't have a lot of like, like real human connection. So like a lot of people just come in and like, they get their pack of cigarettes and they're just like whatever, and they, they don't really have like a conversation, but I'll come in and say, hey, how are you doing today? And they're like, oh, like this foreigner is trying to speak to me. <laughs> So those are again like other things like I can I can use those uh, as opportunities to speak with people, uh, but I notice lots of interesting little things like that about about Japan and Nagasaki too. Drew, could you tell me Alejandro says if kudos is like congratulations, could you please give me more examples of the former? Uh, well, kudos is like it's like a like a maybe a, a slightly less amazing situation. So it's like. Like, hey, I, I, I passed my test. Like, kudos, you know, good work. You know, it's like, a, I mean, you could say uh, congratulations or whatever, but like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a it's, like a, it's like a more reserved way of saying that. It's just, ah, uh, good work, you know. So like, if you, if you got married, I wouldn't say kudos. I would say congratulations, because it's like a more interesting, uh, important thing. And again, it's like good to pay attention to what, uh, what people are saying, uh, like for that situation. All right. Uh, let's see. Hi from Vietnam. Mona again says, uh, maybe it's not the politeness. I think not many people or gaijin do not even try to speak the language like my grandma. Yes, yeah, so like a lot of foreigners, even foreigners can live out in Japan for a long time and still not speak also. So like Japanese will know a lot of the language. So like I help many people from Japan uh, because they know a lot of Japanese or they know a lot of English, but they can't speak very well. And that's because they studied the language. So like what we're talking about today, like the typical Japanese studying is they're going to learn a translation and repeat that rather than learning like I'm showing in this video. So they should be learning English like a like a first uh, as a first language, but usually they don't. So how long will you stay this live? Probably not much longer. I don't have much more time. I don't have much more time. Tomoko-san says my son-in-law doesn't speak at all, even though he has been in Japan for five years. Yeah, so that's common, you know. Maybe so. I guess your daughter. Uh, so your daughter is married to a foreigner, uh, and. Well, so maybe he can he can teach you some English. Do you, where do you live? You live in Tokyo. Where do you live? Uh, so if you try to speak in Japanese, oh, I think I read that one already. Uh, <laughs> All right, injured. I love. I really like that name, injured. I hope you're okay. I think you've been injured for a while. Hopefully you're okay. 
<laughs> you should you should change your screen name to like I'm I'm doing better now. I'm okay. <laughs> Uh, when I speak English, some words I can't say them unless in my native language. Here, can I translate uh, the words from my mind? Uh, it's better to think of a way to express something. So if any any time you think you can't say something because there's not an exact translation, there's usually some way to do that. Like, like motainai in Japanese is like, it's like such a waste. And there are, there are lots of little phrases like that where you might not get a perfect exact translation but you can communicate it in some way and if you use that opportunity to to push yourself a little bit to think about a way to explain something then usually you can but if you just think about a translation then you are kind of slowing your progress more my nose nice let's see Dran, i watched your video pranking the radio host, making them believe that you didn't know how to speak Japanese. <laughs> yes, that, that was a lot of fun. They were really impressed with how you were. Their reaction was so genuine. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mean, and that's another thing. Maybe they were just being good actors, but we didn't, we didn't really tell them very much about what, what we were going to do. And, and I didn't speak like the whole time I was in there before that radio show. I didn't speak any Japanese. I was just like, hello, you know, like being very like loud and American. <laughs> So try like just and that's it like you know part of part of the problem of Americans is we think everybody needs to speak English or whatever so we go around like hey how are you and like people just start speaking so whenever there is a cruise ship in town sometimes I will be at a Starbucks or whatever and like foreigners will come in and the staff will try to like they will do their best um, speaking with them in in English but Muriel says I love uh, Starbucks uh, yes. It's great to, it's great how you catch the melody of a language. Yeah, and that's another thing you, you get as you, as you just like listen to people, listen to people speaking. So especially kids, like I like, I like listening to little kids and how they speak and then watching the differences between like, like when people are expressing something and how they do it. I, that's again, like when you focus on learning as a first language, that's where you really start getting uh, the nuances and other things like that rather than trying to get it through through English. Hi says, I can't read that, uh, the Chinese there. Let's see, how Mune Kat in KSA now? I don't know what that means. Good morning, teacher. Good morning. Why is that chat cut off? That's weird. First of all, thank you. I can about what you were saying. Well, but my English, I get stuck with a lot of grammar. Yeah, just keep focusing. I can't read the whole chat for some reason. I don't know why it's formatted like that. The chat is cut off. Um, but yes, if you... Uh, if you learn like a native, as I'm giving you examples, uh, like I'm doing in this video, then you're going to learn more and start speaking more like a native. That's how it works. Yogi, could you please tell us about your program? Might I would be joined us. Please tell us, please tell us the price. Well, if you click on the link in the description, you will, you will see the price. You will see all about it. But if you have more questions, the basic idea of the program is that you don't get fluent by learning, um, as a second language, you get fluent in English by learning English as a first language. And you do that by getting real examples and having understandable messages, meaning I'm teaching you in an understandable way all in English, and then you're getting lots of review that really helps you understand things. And as you do that, it's, it's the opposite of pretty much everything you would do in a typical language class. So I'm not trying to make you speak, I'm trying to make the language understandable so you feel comfortable about speaking. So we don't begin with speaking, we just give you lots and lots of input about the things you are interested in talking about, uh, but you just do that all by yourself. So you're listening, you're reading, you're watching, you're even writing a little bit just to help you understand things a little bit more, but you learn the same way you learned your native language, and that's how it works. So it's, it's actually a lot more, I don't even say it's really learning like a native because it's more efficient than learning like a native. Because even as, as a native speaker, most people are not very systematic about their learning. And that's why, like, if I, could, if I could take someone like a baby and an adult and, like, teach them, like, I could get them much faster or fluent much faster. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Tsubasa here. Nice to see you there. Mada kitane. Yokotte desu yo. Sound hierarchy says around. Uh, let's see. But, yes, if you have specific questions about the program, let me know. Uh, Rocky, do you feel like you are not true yourself when you are speaking Japanese? 
uh, I do when I am in English. I am Japanese. Uh, I think like you, you get closer to the like the true self, but I, I feel like I am I am basically that now. I notice my personality is a little bit different, but I don't feel like I'm not like expressing myself. So it's I, I'm I'm now at that point with my ability to speak that I feel. Uh, confident and I'm able to communicate with people and it doesn't it doesn't matter like who I'm speaking with I don't I don't feel like I'm a different person so I'm still like having fun and, and telling jokes and other things like that that I do and I can get away with that in Japan because I'm a foreigner I remember I was being introduced I was at like a business dinner uh, with just some local business owners and it was like just like like just a, a dinner a couple of years ago um and i was being uh, introduced so it was me uh and and like just 10 japanese business owners or local community people <clears throat> and and i was introduced by another like the host of the event and he was like this is drew and he's doing this all in in japanese but this is drew he's from japan or he's from america and i quickly i was like <laughs> So I said, like, oh, they found out, like, I'm not Japanese. So that's a joke where, like, they can look at me and tell I'm not Japanese. But if it's like, oh, they found out, like, they discovered and, like, and they laughed, they thought that was very funny. So that's a kind of joke where, like, I, I know the language and I know myself and I'm able to, to put those two things together. So when I first came to Japan, I knew myself, but I didn't know the language. So, like, I would want to say something, but I couldn't because I, I didn't know how to how to like connect those two things. Um, but yeah, so that's like learning Japanese as a, as a first language. And so that, that's, that's the whole point of me. Uh, it's, it's so much fun to be able to go anywhere and I can talk to anybody and like I'm uh, very comfortable going around. And even if I don't know some vocabulary, it's easy for me to learn that from people in the, in the context, in the situation. <clears throat> uh, all right. Reading, writing, grammar, let's see. Uh, you know, Drew, my main problem of speaking English is that I'm a fast speaker in my native language and not being able to speak uh, in English, it drives me crazy. Uh, I speak with shortcuts mainly, any advice. So any advice rather than advice is, remember advice is not countable. We can talk about pieces of advice or bits of advice or just some advice, but advice itself is not countable. Um, but the I would, I would just get, again, like the, the way I speak, my, I actually speak a little bit faster in Japanese than I do in English. Um, it's like, I don't, I, I'm not like a terribly fast speaker in English anyway, but uh, I notice like I speak, like my Japanese, like, it likes to come out faster now. But uh, for your situation, I think it's like um, an easier thing to do if you just focus on, on trying to be like correct uh, and just try to communicate what you are at a slower pace, just kind of like slow yourself down, just to get good at doing the thing, and then you get faster over time as you as you practice doing it more. Uh, but get lots more input, and the input will make it a much easier thing. Like the more input, the more systematic input, and the systematic part is really important there, because if you're just getting like random English, then you're not really going to improve very much. But if you get systematic input, that will help you a lot. <clears throat> All right, uh, Mom, it says, what is the difference between what about you and how about you? Uh, in, in that situation, what about you is like, what do you think and how about you? You can use both of those the same way. Yeah, so I understood what you meant about not being able to speak quickly in English. So if you're naturally fast in your native language, but not so fast in English, then just it's okay. Try to slow yourself down. It's okay to, to, to relax about that. Get better at speaking, and then you will, you will naturally start speaking more uh, and have a faster speech as well. I mainly learn English from listening. I understand 100% of what someone said in English, but it's hard for me to speak English. It's like opening a book full of verbs and don't know uh, which word is applicable to say. Yeah. So again, depending on how you learn, most people are learning English as a second language. And that means that they're, they're usually getting like one or two examples of something and they're not really trying to understand situations and what natives would say in situations. 
So the more you learn English as a first language, and this is what we teach in Fluent for Life uh, and all the videos on YouTube as well, if you can go back to my like very first YouTube video and we're talking about the same thing. Uh, let's see. Hi, teacher. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, let's see. Uh, you noticed your mistake. How can I... Learning English. You could say, how can I learn English? You learn English the same way you learned your native language. That's how you do it. That's the whole secret. All right. Well, I'm losing my voice over here. I think I got through everything I wanted to say. Remember, just to recap everything, we've got these two basic core ways of learning vocabulary. If you learn a new word, you can go deeper into that thing, just like you can go deeper into a subject itself and learn the different aspects or pieces of it. Or another thing is if you're focusing on a situation, you can pay attention for the different ways that natives speak. And so what's a different expression or phrase or something uh, that you could use. And even it's the same thing with vocabulary or grammar. Um, so you could, like I showed before, like I don't have time or I haven't time. So it's the same thing. They mean the same thing, but I'm using different words in order to do that. Transis, thanks. It was nice to see you back. Yes. Uh, and I will probably be back, uh, I think, next Monday, my time. Uh, and then around the same time we started this video. So if you have any questions, you can send us an email at info at englishanyone.com, but do click the video like button, click that like button, let other people know, hey, you should watch this guy because he will help you learn like a native speaker and actually get you fluent. And then also click on the links in the description below this video if you'd like to learn more about Frederick and Fluent for Life. Have a nice day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.